The prime goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent from the majority. And in order to do that, you've got to fragment the majority so they really can't get together and do very much. And you have to concentrate power in the wealth of the nation. I'm here back in New York, fresh from my trip to Turkey. I just, this is what, what, this is my commute getting here today. I got on a flight in Bodrum, no, car to the airport, Bodrum to Istanbul, five hour layer in Istanbul, flight, cab to my house, washed my hair, uh, cause it was disgusting. Uh, and then I took a train and a cab to get here to this exciting show because we have with us uh, Dr. Robert Epstein, Senior Research Psychologist for the American Institute of Behavioral Research and Technology. You also used to run Psychology Today, and you might be the only person on Earth, or at least the only one who I've been in the same room with, who at one point was banned from Google. Yes, that's right. And we have Matt Taylor, who is the director of the new documentary, The Creepy Line, all about search engine um, manipulation. Mm -hmm. and how the consequences has for our society. And there was so many, I watched the documentary on the plane. There were so many things that you were hitting upon that it's just gonna take a while to unpack. First of all, can you tell us, Dr. Epstein, can you tell us the story of how you woke up and, and saw that you couldn't access google.com? Well, that was because an article came out in the Washington Post about some research that I had uh, just released publicly. And the research uh, was on the discovery of what I call the uh, search engine manipulation effect or SEME, S-E-M-E. And I, I was showing in some experiments that uh, just by ordering things in a certain way on the search results, uh, you could easily uh, shift opinions and votes. In fact, uh, I found you could easily shift votes uh, of undecided people by more than 20%. Uh, I later learned, in fact, you could shift uh, the votes by as much as 80% in some groups. But the point is, Washington Post reported this and uh, the next day, I could not access Google.com, which is really crazy. I've never seen that before. Uh, and so I have great screenshots of all these timeouts trying to access Google.com. So one of the things that you talked about in the film is that when you give people, let's suppose you had two candidates, and you gave them, they searched for one candidate, you gave them a list of only positive articles, those undecided voters are going to shift towards that candidate, right? Uh, if you have a negative results for that candidate, they're gonna shift toward the candidate's opponent. And Google, it, Google does this in a way where it's subtle, so you don't realize it's happening, is that not correct? Uh, yes, in fact, you wouldn't really just give them uh, a list of, of uh, you know, positive search results that link to you know, web, positive pages. It wouldn't do things that way exactly you would do things more subtly. So over the years, in fact, uh, I've studied different ways to, uh, to mask this effect, to hide it, and uh, got to the point where we could, in fact, shift votes and opinions without anyone knowing that they were being manipulated, without anyone seeing any kind of bias or favoritism uh, in the search rankings. And it turns out it's not just search rankings that Google's using. Um, they're also using the search suggestions, those that they flash at you, uh, when you start to type a search term, it turns out that they're actually manipulating your opinion from the very first character you start to type into that search bar. And then there's those answer boxes that they show you. So Google, just on that one page, that one search page, is manipulating people uh, pretty heavily um, in at least three different ways. And we've been you know, studying and quantifying those. But it's not just Google either. You know, there's there are other big players out there. The main one being Facebook, and so we've been studying um, how Facebook, in fact, uh, you know, nudges our thinking this way and that without people knowing. And I have an article uh, coming out in a few days, actually, um, on ten different ways that uh, big tech companies will be able to shift millions of votes in the midterm elections. Uh, without anyone knowing. And uh, the, uh, the estimate I have in the article is upwards of 12 million votes can be shifted in this way. Again, with no one knowing that this is occurring. But the, 
The question I have is how much of this is intentional and how much of this is a function of the math and how the results are displayed? Michael, if you had asked me that question a couple of years ago, I would have given you this long-winded technical answer. But uh, now, I, I'm, in fact, I, my thinking has changed completely. Okay. I, I, what I say is, who cares? I don't, I don't care whether it's intentional or not. Uh, because uh, the algorithms, if, if in fact they're favoring one dog food over another, or one online music service over another, or one candidate over another, sure. that shifts thinking, it shifts behavior, and it does so uh, fairly dramatically. And so it doesn't matter if there's intentionality or not. Uh, you could say, well, yeah, but people wrote the algorithm, right? Uh, well, yeah, people wrote the algorithm, and maybe they're just not paying attention to it anymore. But the algorithm itself, if it, in, if it indeed puts one thing over another, which is what, what of course, Google's algorithm is programmed to do, it's programmed sure. to, to order things, then it has this impact. So I, uh, you know, there, there's the scenario in which uh, some uh, executive at Google or some rogue employee, uh, you know, is fiddling with things. Sure, that could happen. But what I'm saying is, even in the absence of intentionality, even in, in the absence of human fiddling, the algorithm itself is extremely dangerous because you could think of it this way: it's programmed to be biased. It's always programmed. Uh, to put things into an order and to put, again, one dog food ahead of another, and that affects the thinking and the behavior and the purchases and the attitudes and the beliefs of literally billions of people around the world. But the, the word bias is a loaded word, and here's why. It, there are objective criteria by which one dog food is better than another. For example, if I'm looking for the cheapest, it's going to be this. If I'm looking for the one that's most approved by doctors it's, or veterinarians, excuse me, it's going to be this. So a lot of uh, my point of view is, isn't a lot of time that algorithm going to be smarter than that voter? I agree that the word bias is troublesome, and, and when I use the term, I'm using it in a, simply in a statistical sense. Um, we want the algorithm to be biased. Right. It's right. built in. That was the, at the very beginning of the film we talked about that. That's, how, sure. that's why Google beat the competitors. Absolutely. We want it to be biased. Uh, and, and when it comes to dog food, we want, us to, we want it to give us the best possible answer for us. And uh, you know, we could argue that point, um, you know, maybe maybe uh, uh, maybe it's not using the right criteria, maybe it's not making the right determination. But when it comes to, to things like elections, that's a little bit different. When it, when it comes to you making important decisions on tough issues, that's a little bit different because there is no right, not really. Uh, and so whatever it's doing, shouldn't we at least understand what it's doing? And if it indeed is giving us a list which favors one candidate over another or one cause over another, shouldn't we know that that's occurring? See, the problem is that when we do our research over and over again, we find people can't see the favoritism. They right. can't see it at all. So in fact, they are being manipulated. Their thinking is being changed and they have absolutely no idea that this is occurring. This is different than a, listening to a radio show, which, you know, this is different than listening to a podcast. This is different than seeing a billboard but because that stuff you can see, you, you know, you know, when someone's expressing a point of view, you can see the human hand. But, but if you, you were working in yeah. psychology today, there's so many things that we don't see barring Google, such as confirmation bias, bandwagon effect. Uh, the human mind is inherently biased. And, and many people, when they're looking for a candidate, they don't have any idea of what the issue is, nor should they necessarily. Maybe they're going to want the candidate that's just who everyone else like them is going for. And that's going to be a short heuristic for who to vote for, which I think many people, especially on Decideds, that is their criterion for selecting a candidate. They're not sitting down with all the issues. They're sitting down and being like, okay, who do the people in my socioeconomic cast vote for? And, and I, 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 that's more of a criticism of democracy than of Google. Well, I'm glad you mentioned psychology today because uh, I used to run it, of course, and uh, sure, we're, we're selecting what we're showing people and we're deciding which article goes first in the magazine and which article goes last, and those tend to be read the most, and sure, we're, we're doing all that stuff, except people can see it. That's the difference. And, and not only that, there's a lot of com competition. There are hundreds, thousands of magazines and newspapers, and, but with Google, there's a huge difference because people 
all they see is 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 the output of a computer the output of an algorithm which people tend to trust blindly and there is no competitor google has no competitor in most of the world 90 percent of search is done on google no competitor you can't see the favoritism you can't even see the human hand so that's why we get these enormous shifts i'll give you a quick example here uh, the latest body, body of research that we've made public has to do with those uh, autocomplete search suggestions you get when you start to type right. a search term. And here's what we found. Uh, first of all, uh, that you are, in fact, being manipulated from the very first character you type. When you type an A, for example, depending on who you are in your history well, and all that. Right here. We oh, got a computer right here. Try let's it. let's try see it. what the guest digital people are try Googling. It. Okay. That's hopefully it's not too uh, offensive. We're going to get a new new window open. I hate I hate using a touchpad. Okay, we're typing with letter A. Yep, into google.com. Hold on a second. Google. All right. I just googled the word Google. And it gives me Google News, Google Drive, Google Classroom and so on and so forth. Hold on a second. Yep. Let's do A. You must have Yeah, that's yeah, if yeah, you type yeah, a G. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need a mouse. If you type, well, that's a very good example, by the way. If you type a G, then you start getting suggestions to go to visit Google products. So that's already a manipulation. Okay, A gives me uh, two ones I'm not going to mention. Add Google Home Device, Amazon, and AOL Mail. Okay, so that's very interesting. So they, they obviously know who you are. You don't take steps to hide. Right. Uh, Whoever's computer this is, yeah. Whoever's computer that is, right. Uh, uh, but you'll notice that fourth one was Amazon, as yeah. I recall. For most people, or if you if you you connect in a in a in a way so they don't know who you are, you'll get Amazon first. Uh, now the reason why for most people they're going to see Amazon is because well, there's two reasons. One is that Amazon happens to be Google's biggest advertiser. Uh, I mean, I think they're spending right now about three hundred million dollars a year, believe it or not, on Google, and. Looking at it from the other side, um, Google is Amazon's biggest source of traffic. Okay. So you're seeing a business partner. But uh, more disturbing than that, um, we've, we've learned through a series of experiments that just using those search suggestions, Google can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea that they've been manipulated. This is very, very different. This is this. These are new kinds of manipulations that have never existed before in human history, and certainly not on this scale. Because we're not just talking about influencing voters in Kansas; we're talking about influencing people around the world. You just came from Turkey. Yeah. Uh, I would bet you dollars to donuts that uh, about ninety percent of search uh, in Turkey is done on Google because it is throughout the EU. And, and Wikipedia is banned in Turkey, actually. Interesting. Very interesting. Wait, go ahead. So you finish your thought. Well, I, I'm just saying that the 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 types of manipulations uh, that we're studying are new. I mean, we're we're, we're naming them because they don't have names. Sure. Uh, and the scale on which uh, these uh, these tools are being used is also unprecedented. Uh, and all of this power is in the hands of a very very small number of people who are not accountable to us. Like, there are. I I, I, not, Matt, I'm sorry I'm not getting to you, but there's just so much in this that, that, no, I'm, that's, he, that, that I'm not... It's fascinating. But what you're describing is also the government. You know, you have a monopoly that's unaccountable. And I, the idea that somehow the masses are being manipulated now, it's new. I mean, this has been happening since the foundation of this country or since the beginning. This, you know, Plato times, people have been complaining about this, that, you know, you're going to have this small elite. Mark Hanna, you know, getting McKinley into office is a, another example. Every time there's a new form of media, there's going to be a new form of manipulation. Now, you're saying that I, I agree with you that this is new because it's being done subtly and invisibly. But at the same time, do you disagree as from a psychology background that most people want to be manipulated when it comes to their voting preferences? Again, that's a kind of something one, something one can debate about. Um, I, in fact, I, I've actually read uh, some historical uh, uh, books about Russia, uh, which argue very strongly that the Russian people want to be controlled and yes. want to be. Yeah. So, and I and I was invited to talk about my research in Russia and had very interesting discussions there on this very topic and. Maybe culturally, there are a lot of Russians who who want that. I'm not sure so many Americans want that, uh, um, but 
you know, I, the question here is uh, is not really about control. There are always sources of control out there. Uh, and the government certainly uh, from time to time uh, can overdo it. But, you know, we we have an interesting kind of governmental structure. We we do vote people out of office. Um, you know, obviously administrations uh, change and sometimes that changes everything. We're all experiencing that uh, right now. Uh, the government is, uh, you know, not just in theory, but in practice, the government really is accountable to the public. The problem with a private company having this power is they're not accountable to anybody. And the way Google, Google's uh, stock is structured, in fact, uh, the major shareholders, which is just a handful of people, they're not even accountable to the rest of the shareholders. So uh, the power that Google wields, and of course, Facebook is a player too, sure, yeah. Uh, is is truly unprecedented. And again, what's really odd here is this. Look, a government, generally speaking, it is trying to control or keep under control its people. Of right. course, absolutely. Uh, but Google, although it is technically an American company, Google is exercising uh, this power uh, pretty much in every country in the world. Now, uh, a few months ago, I would have immediately said, well, except for China, of course. But of course, now Google is allying with the Chinese government, uh, you know, to help them control their people. And of course, Google can do it better than anybody and, and far better than um, than China's own search engine, which is called Baidu. So, uh, you know, this there, there are things happening here that are really, truly scary, uh, which I think are beautifully uh, uh, explained in this new film, The Creepy Line. And there are things we, we need to get out in the open. Uh, you know, if we all sit down and decide, hey, that's okay, that's fine. We're, we're going to be controlled. The world will be run from now on by Google and Facebook. And we all say, that's fine. Let's take a vote on it. Yep, that's what we want to do. Fine. But I don't think people are aware that this is even occurring, that this is a threat. See, I think the difference between your and my worldview is that you think Brave New World is a dystopia. And I think it's kind of like the goal. <laughs> because I do think most people, like H.L. Mencken said, the average man does not want to be free. He wants to be safe. Most people would prefer to be, you know, not to, ha to have the illusion of choice, but then have it be kind of taken away and, and think they've made a freely informed choice when they don't have the capacity to do so. But Matt, what I want to talk to you about is mm -hmm. what does this title, The Creepy Line, refer to? And, and talk to me about – there were so many examples of just disturbing behavior like what you were talking about, Dr. Epstein, of uh, social media manipulation that we were just completely oblivious to. Well, you know, the, the title comes from a famous Eric Schmidt quote in 2010 where he said Google walks up to the creepy line but doesn't cross it. Um, as a, you know, he said as a joke, but it's not really a joke. And as Dr. Epstein says in the film, they cross it every day. Um, they, in fact, they move the creepy line. They keep moving it. And what's really, what struck me as really interesting in making the film, something I kind of saw is that every time we know Google does something wrong, it's because they were caught. Right. It wasn't like, oh, like, the antenna is defective, so we're going to recall the product. Or, oh, you know, it's, it's not like all other tech companies will recall the product or they'll issue an apology. They're caught every single time. Every time. And then on top of being caught, I mean, they pay out these huge fines. Right. If you had any government official who failed over and over and over again, we'd get rid of them. But if doesn't had, that say that Google is being held more accountable than the government is? I mean, the thing is, though, is they pay it out and they, they keep doing it. I mean, if they weren't caught, like kind of like the street view, if they weren't caught, it just means that they don't have any respect for any law of any sort, you know. And so that's what kind of struck me is like they will do whatever they want. And if they're not caught, they'll just keep doing it forever. You know, at least some public officials are somewhat afraid of being caught, you know, so they may they may be corrupt, but they ramp it down. They, you know, Google doesn't have any of those restrictions. Michael Malice here. I want to tell you about today's episode sponsored by Heshi Socks, H-E-S-H-I-S-O-C-K-S dot com. I talk about them every week and I wear them every day. Regular socks are thin. They don't provide protection. Your feet hurt when you wear those nice shoes and they cost too much money. Here's why I like Heshi socks. They cut out the middleman, so it's high quality socks that are not expensive. If you use the promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off. So they're cushioned in the footbed, the heel and the toe. It's like wearing pillows on your feet. They've got arch support in the center, so they stay secure. And they've made with this high-end Pima cotton. Trust me, you feel it. It's super, super soft, but also breathable. So if your feet sweat, it kills the bacteria and the socks don't smell. 
They got the nice the fashion stuff. They got the basic stuff. You can wear with dress shoes. You could wear with sneakers. If you go to Heshi Socks, H-E-S-H-I Socks.com and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off and you will thank me for it. And you're welcome. Talk a bit about what you learned about Facebook with uh, making this film. Well, you know, I I have a my view is is that Facebook is is terrifying, but Google is worse. But I think at least with Facebook, you have the choice to not use it. Um, I think you don't have to use Facebook. Wait, but isn't the point that my friend was telling me this? And please correct me if I'm mm-hmm. wrong. My friend was telling me that Facebook is monitoring your traffic online, even if you're not logged in, or even if you're not mm-hmm. a Facebook user. Is that accurate? That I would have to ask Dr. Epstein. Uh, well, they they have uh, they have these uh, these little um, pieces of code uh, that are scattered on millions of websites, just like Google has AdWords, right? Google has AdSense, and Facebook has uh, has something like that as well. So they do they they monitor you, but they don't they're not monitoring you when you're offline. Uh, Google is monitoring you now when you're offline. Facebook at the moment, as far as I know, is not yet doing that. But yeah, that's the goal for all of these companies. Uh, so, so even Amazon, uh, which is you know has sold uh, several million of these uh, uh, these Echo devices, uh, where you talk to this uh, this female voice named Alexa, uh, you know they're they're now monitoring you when you're offline. But uh, there we don't. Amazon has a different business model. You know, with Facebook and Google, they don't really have products to sell for the most part. The product they sell is us. So they're they're collecting data about us. Every single service they provide is it, it seems like a service. It's that's not really a service. What it is is a surveillance platform. Every single uh, service that they ever set up, every company that they buy, and they buy on average one company every week, uh, they're doing that to get more data about us. They bought YouTube to get more data about us. They're putting these home devices, uh, these listening devices yeah. in every home to get more data so they can sell us. So Google and Facebook have a unique business model, which I call the surveillance business model. Uh, other companies like Apple, Microsoft, uh, even Amazon have a more traditional model where they actually sell you stuff. They're not, you know, but as I say, Google and Facebook, they're selling us yeah, so when Mike, Mark Zuckerberg was in front of Congress and he was saying, well, we sell ads, Senator, he was being disingenuous because it's not just ads. He's selling data. Mm-hmm. But it was the creepy smile. That oh, yeah. Was Did you see that I... GIF? Someone yeah. made a GIF that said, like, initiate smile sequence. And they, <laughs> they move the lever and it smiles and he'd move it down. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it was very disturbing. Yeah, well, there's that's what I'm saying. There's, there's, it, there's, there's something new happening. It's, it's very new. It's deceptive. See, it's not, it's not like... Um, the, the lar- supposedly, if you look look up advertising agencies, supposedly the largest advertising agency is located in London, and I think it does about seventeen billion dollars a year in business, which is that's a lot, mm-hmm. right? And I, I I read that and I thought to myself, wait a minute now, that's crazy. Google does over a hundred billion dollars a year in uh, in, in business. More than ninety percent of it comes from advertising revenue. They they are the largest advertising agency in the world, except they don't portray themselves right. that way. It's the deception that's the problem. If we really knew what was going on every minute, everyone was informed and over and over again, making the same stupid decision to share all the data and not care about it, that would be one thing. But that's not what's happening. We have these services that look like cool free services it looks like all kind of cool things that a public library would do but public libraries do not track people they do not sell the information they have about you they do not lobby congress so something different is happening with these companies yeah but maybe not public libraries but the nsa certainly tracks us on a far greater level than google does nsa is not doing it for with a profit motive and nsa has you know some legitimate uh mission for for our security uh i'm not saying there aren't abuses by governments of course there are but again governments are there to serve us generally speaking and they are ultimately accountable to us at least uh, at least in, in in democratic countries uh, this is different, you know, private companies where, where they can just do, I mean, Matt mentioned, Matthew just mentioned a, a few minutes ago, uh, about some of the fines that have been levied against Google. Can I just give you a couple, Please. a little sampling here? Cause maybe people <laughs> won't know about some of these. 
Uh, first of all, and, if you, and it's not just the amounts; it's what it's for. I think that's what makes it pernicious. Right. So here's here's a, here's an example. I bet you most most uh, people have not heard of this, but um, a few years ago, the FTC uh, levied a, a twenty one million dollar fine, which at the time was the largest fine that they had ever levied against anyone against Google for hmm, what did they do? Oh, that's it. They hacked Safari which is uh, Apple's browser. They hacked Safari so that everyone using Safari on any Apple device could be tracked by Google. Because didn't you learn about this when you, you, not only could you not access Google from Chrome, but somehow you couldn't access it from competing web browsers, which made no sense. Well, that's, that's a little different. And I, I, I can explain yeah. what, what that's about. That's scary too. That has to do with their blacklists, which is very yeah, scary. We'll get to that in a second. Please yeah, yeah. continue with the fines. More, here's some more fines here. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, also, a few years ago, in fact, I, I actually met the man who initiated this, the Attorney General of Rhode Island. A few years ago, Google uh, was was fined five hundred million dollars. Uh, and again, initially by the state of Rhode Island, the uh, Department of Justice got involved at some point as well for doing what? What do they do? Five hundred million dollars. By the way, people just are unaware of this. That's a pretty big fine. Well, it turns out that for years, they had been using their AdWords system to sell Canadian drugs to Americans. Well, that's illegal. So they were sent warning letters over and over and over again saying, this is illegal, desist, desist, cease and desist. And they just ignored that. So the 500 million, it turns out, was the profit they had made over the years they were doing this. And they basically had to turn over all that profit uh, to the government in, in a fine, but there were no criminal charges ever uh, levied against them, which ever brought against them, which is a little weird. Uh, let's see. Oh, then the Street View scandal, which uh, Matthew mentioned. The Street View scandal. Well, it turns out a, a professor, uh, I think it's, it's, I think it was at Stanford, if I'm not mistaken, somehow figured out. So he's like me. He yeah. somehow figures things out, and he somehow figured out that Google Street View vehicles, which at this point were in more than 30 countries, driving up and down the streets, photographing everyone's house, everyone's business. Uh, weren't just photographing, they were also sucking up unprotected Wi-Fi data, including passwords and uh, you name it, you know, blogs, everything people were typing, everything. They had been doing that for more than four years in more than 30 countries. Uh, Google at first denied this. Uh, you know, the uh, FTC launched an investigation, multiple countries la launched investigations. Ultimately, <clears throat> Google was fined $25,000 for obstructing the investigation. No one was arrested. It turns out what they were doing was not illegal, but they promised to stop, at least in the United States. And they blamed one person. Google blamed one person on this, a guy named Marius Milner. Marius Milner. Hmm. Okay, so that's scary. First of all, because yeah, why think, is Marius Milner scary? Well, listen, listen. Okay, that's scary. <laughs> is that because, an anagram of some sort? <laughs> well, no, 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 no. He's a real guy, but it's scary. First of all, because it tells you that it's not just an executive at Google who can do amazing and incredible and scary things, but a single, an individual software engineer at Google could do crazy and wild and huge. In fact, could shift an election. But how how is it avoidable? Like for example, President Trump was kicked off Twitter by some rogue Twitter employee, right? And then they, they re reinstated his account, but it was gone for like 12 hours. I don't understand how that's avoidable with any corporation. Everyone is gonna have some power to do something that's their job. Right, but because Google has so much power in so many places to do so many things, it means that one particular guy, Marius Milner, in theory, could be sucking up Wi-Fi data from more than 30 countries oh, for I see more than saying. four years. It's the scale of the things that can be done because a single software engineer uh, basically could not only shift an election, but could, could put a business out of business. I mean, literally with a few clicks, that's, that's a power that no one's ever had before. Now- That's the power of the state. Of course, of course, though, everyone knows the ending to this story, which is that Marius Milner was fired. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. That's right. I'm getting my stories confused. He wasn't <laughs> fired. He is a hero at Google, and he lists himself even now on LinkedIn as a hacker working for Google. So, no, they don't. 
they don't punish people for doing wild and crazy things like this because they got terabytes of data. But I, I don't understand your insistence that the state is accountable and Google isn't when Lois Lerner is off the top of my head. Not only was she by paper trail targeting conservative groups, then they pretended they lost hard drives for a certain specific period and had no consequences. So the idea that, like, I know this like a Faustian bargain in some sense, but the idea that the NSA is more accountable to us than Google. It, it just, I, I don't understand how you can say that. Well, there are differences. Let me, let me give you another couple of fines here. Okay. Um, last year, uh, the European Union fined Google $2.7 billion for having biased search rankings, for literally putting their own comparative shopping service ahead of those of competitors, which dramatically increased the size sure. of their operation and uh, nearly put everyone else out of business. And uh, the Euro European Union collected a tremendous amount of data over a period of years to prove that this was the case and to prove that it was deliberate and Google paid the fine. And then this year, a $5.1 billion fine against Google also by the EU, this time for monopolistic practices with its uh, mobile operating system called Android. Uh, I mean, I could go on. I, I, is, I don't understand the idea that given a choice between Google and the EU, uh, that we should choose the, what the EU wants. Well, again, I, I would just want to point out that we're talking about a handful of individuals who are not accountable to us. You in mean the any EU? Manner, no, 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 no. I'm talking about executives. But how is the and, EU accountable to us? How The EU has no uh, ability to affect us, whereas the, the small number of individuals uh, at Google and to lesser extent Facebook, they can affect everything we think, do, and say 24 hours a day without our knowing, number one, and number two, without leaving a paper trail. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing like that anywhere else. How did you track down, this, this blew my mind, how did you track down, because you said it took you a while, and obviously you're, you're, quite, you're, you know, you're sophisticated in their techniques, right, and their tactics. How did you f t figure out how Google was keeping you off of using Google.com on competing browsers? That just beggars belief. Well, okay, the competing browsers issue, let me explain that, let me explain that. I was, I was notified by Google on uh, January 1st of 2012. And, and by the way, some, a friend just pointed out to me last night that remember January 1st, 2012, wasn't that supposed to be like the beginning of a new era or the end of humankind? Like or... the Mexican calendar? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. So, the mind calendar, excuse well, me, yeah. I guess my world was shaken because <laughs> I, I got a bunch of notices from Google, I think 10 of them, uh, saying my website had been hacked. Oh, which is fine. I mean, Google's been hacked. Everyone gets hacked. There's nothing sure. wrong with that. But I wondered, why was Google notifying me? Why, why wasn't I being notified by a government agency, a nonprofit right. organization, something? I mean, who made them sheriff, in other words? That was one question. Then I found out they had no customer service department. I thought that was kind of odd. And you know, But the thing that really got me was they were blocking my websites not only through their search engine i get that it makes perfect sense yeah. right they found some malware absolutely like, yeah warning this site may harm your computer warning. that kind of stuff yeah not only through chrome which is their browser i get that too makes sense but then i found out they were blocking me through safari which is an apple browser and they were even blocking me through firefox which was run by a nonprofit organization called mozilla that's that was, I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer since I was 13. So, wow, that intrigued me. I was wondering, how does that work technically? And yeah, I did eventually figure that stuff out. And wow, it is, it is, it's mind boggling and it's brilliant. It's just genius. Everything they do is genius. People think I don't like Google or something like that. I am Google's biggest admirer on this planet because I know more about what they do probably than anyone else. And uh, what they do is just genius. But, but how did they do it? And well, and Google, I, I wrote a big piece for US News and World Report, which I, I would recommend that people look at because it's still very, very relevant to what's happening today, uh, called The New Censorship. And in The New Censorship, I, I go through uh, uh, nine different blacklists uh, that Google has. And in fact, they have probably a lot more than that. But uh, they, main, they maintain various kinds of blacklists. Well. It turns out their biggest blacklist, which is the scariest one, is the list of websites they don't want people to visit. Uh, and on any given day, that probably has several million websites on it. It's, it's not a tiny list. 
uh, they acknowledge, they admit to adding more than 10,000 or so uh, new websites to the list every day. So this is, they, you know, they acknowledge that there is such a list. They call it their quarantine list. So it turns out that because they crawl the internet more than anyone else does, right. well, they have the best, best blacklist too. They're, they're, they're good at identifying malware. But they, you know, you can get blacklisted by them um, for other reasons too. They, they, you know, at one point blacklisted uh, an entire domain. Uh, there was a certain day in 2009, and they don't deny this, where they blacklisted, in other words, blocked access to, the entire internet for about 40 minutes. Uh, a few months ago, they ended up uh, accidentally, accidentally uh, blocking access to uh, all of the websites in Japan. I, I think in the film I said half, but in fact it was all of the oh, websites wow. in Japan. Okay. Yeah, so we've got that little mistake. <laughs> uh, but uh, the point is that, uh, so since they have the best blacklist, well, it turns out that Safari, an Apple product, it checks Google's blacklist before it sends you anywhere. Oh, which think of, think about that. That gives Google information about the search that you're doing on Safari. See the genius of it? Uh, and it turns out that Firefox, even though Firefox cut ties with Google a few years ago, if you read carefully, you know, the materials that, that Firefox issued when they broke ties with Google, they mentioned kind of, you know, almost as a footnote, uh, but we're still using their blacklist. So even Firefox is using that blacklist. So Google's influence is is all over the place. You don't you don't even know it's there, but they are determining a lot of what happens uh out there in the world of tech i mean uh, google analytics for example is on right. tens of millions of websites and uh, you know and they give it to everyone for free and it allows you to learn you know what kind of traffic you're getting on your website so it's a great uh, another one of these great free services except if you look at google's terms of service what it says is if you're using a google product even if you don't know you're using a google product we can track you so when they give you Google Analytics to put on your website for free, from that point on, they're tracking everyone who visits your website. Michael Niles here. I want to tell you about BetDSI.com. They've been in business for over 20 years. Paying winners, top rated on sportsbook review sites with an easy to use mobile playing interface. You play, you win, you get paid. BetDSI has a great mobile app. It's easy to use from anywhere with live in-game wagering. So you can make plays throughout the entire games and events. They've offer odds on pretty much everything else. You can use BetDSI for major sports, politics, reality TV, pretty much everything. I recommend BetDSI if you want to add a little excitement to the games you're watching. Even if you don't like sports, this is how you have fun watching the NFL season or whatever and have the funnest work day of your life. If you go to BetDSI.com and use welcome promo code WELCOME100, you get a 200% bonus on your initial deposit. That's free money. So just go to BetDSI.com and use promo code WELCOME100. Matt, you interviewed Jordan Peterson for this film, and yeah. he's another person who kind of got the short end of the stick when it came to crossing, uh, like, big tech. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me that story? Yeah, so basically, he, you know, Jordan Peterson has a fairly robust YouTube. Uh, he's got 50 million subscribers, and I he was uh, doing a video on... I think it was uh, C-16, a law about uh, gender identification in Canada, and they took out his, um, they took down his Google services. And what was interesting about it was it wasn't that they took down the video or that they took down the YouTube channel. They took down all of his services, his email, his calendar, his YouTube page. I mean, most people are like, oh, my, my video was banned. No, they they wiped them out entirely, um, and it was it was gone, and so he couldn't get access to it. And there was um, no one to call because since Google makes no products, there's no customer service. I can go to the Apple store, I can I can right. call Apple, I can call Microsoft. There's no one to call, and I, and I believe that he said it was flagged by a machine, and then it went on to people, and they just kept him banned, and that was it. He's gone. Blip, you're, you're finished. And what's terrifying about that is that if you can't get to your email or your calendar, you know, which has nothing to do with the service, right. um, and they have the full right to, to eliminate all those services. And if it wasn't for his connections to the press and the media, he would be gone forever. And I think the problem comes is when you have, you know, smaller people who are doing, you know, innocuous things and they get blown out and you'll never, we'll just never know. 
It's not even that. I think the bigger threat is that people end up self-censoring because then they know that they're smaller, so they're going to uh, proactively, mm -hmm. tr you know, try to stay very far on this side of being obedient. So yeah. it's not even that you're not going to hear about them. It's that they're going to. This is a very effective way to, as you obviously know, to modify people's behavior. Well, if this happened to Jordan Peterson, I'm not going to talk about this issue at all. And that's a that's the even more effective mechanism of censorship. Well, well, I think I think another uh, issue here is has to do with. Uh, although before I was I was setting the intentionality issue aside, it has to do with the fact that that the top people at Google have been very very open about the fact uh, that they have the power uh, to you know to to improve humanity, and that they have uh, the the desire to improve humanity. Uh, recently, uh, a video leaked from Google that got a lot of attention and, and a big email. Uh, showing what everyone knew anyway, which is uh, that they have a very strong liberal bias. Wait, hold on. Everyone might have known it, but seeing that woman who is a top person yeah, at Google yeah. crying, <laughs> literally crying, and this wasn't even the day after the election oh, yeah. when they're shocked, that was almost pornographic in its beauty. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it, <laughs> you know having, having that stuff actually, you know, seeing it for yourself and seeing the people, the top people at Google all basically acknowledging, hey, but yes. It, it, it almost seemed like some your crazy conservative uncle at Thanksgiving dinner. He's like, I bet you they were crying at Google because <laughs> Trump showed them. And to have it actually be true. They were crying. I, 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 and to be crying at, at work in front of your subordinates, I think that that is really creepy because that's telling you something. If someone is this passionate about the electoral choices, you really know how you have to act in that office. Okay, the point is they have motivation. They yeah. have motivation. I mean, you know, uh, if you're if you're a, a, a criminologist, uh, uh, you're, you know, you're looking for motive and opportunity, right? Right. Okay, so maybe we weren't too sure about motive. I think now we're a little more sure about motive. Uh, but there's another video though that leaked. I think uh, maybe a, a year ago now that in a way is even more disturbing than the new video. Didn't get so much attention. Uh, it has a name. Uh, it, it's it's called the Selfish Ledger, and it's only eight minutes long. And if you really want to get creeped out about about Google, watch the Selfish Ledger. It's not copyrighted either, by the way, so you can we can all steal it uh, because it's an internal video made by kind of the the advanced ideas department at Google and shared with other people at Google. And the Selfish Ledger is about the company's ability to reshape humankind. And it specifically mentions using the company's values. That's in there. I'm not making this stuff up. So, uh, and they, they kind of, uh, I mean, they know it. They, they know the power they have. Let's put it this way. If, if I have over the years uh, discovered, studied, quantified, let's say five techniques that Google has for manipulating people, how many are there, in fact? Right. That's the question. Are there 10? Are there 50? Are there 100? I mean, I have to assume that whatever I've stumbled onto by, by accident is just, you know, tip of the iceberg. I have to assume that, that whatever, manip however I'm able to use these techniques to manipulate people in my experiments, I have to assume Google is much, much better. And however I... I, whatever ways I find to mask what I'm doing, to, to hide the manipulation people, I, 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 I guarantee you, uh, Google is much better. So they have the motive and they have the opportunity. They have the means. Uh, and I think more and more we're going to be discovering uh, that Google is, in fact, deliberately messing with people all over the world. I think that's what we're going to find. And the way to discover that for sure, the way to prove it is with monitoring systems. So that's kind of where my head is these days. Well, let me let me play devil's advocate for a second, okay? We know by the fact that this this woman's crying, you know, at work and she must have been crying at home whatever that where they're falling politically, right? So this would have been a, a Hillary Clinton organization. Given the fact, and that they're obviously engaging, intentionally or not, there is bias. Uh, and it's, it's going to be biased in their values. It's going to be toward Hillary Clinton. Given the fact that Trump ended up winning, are you saying that, but for Google, he would have had more votes? Oh, yes, because I actually set up a monitoring system in secret um, early in 2016. And so I had uh, it's kind of a Nielsen model. I had field agents around the country uh, um, uh, 
my colleagues and I developed a custom software that we installed with the permission of our field agents, of course, but we installed on their system so we could look over their shoulders when they were uh, conducting election-related searches using Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Uh, and, now, and then we preserved those searches. We preserved the searches, more than 13,000 searches, and we preserved the, I think it's 87,000 web pages to which the search results connected. So we could see whether there were any biases in the search results. And we found uh, a statistical bias in all 10 search positions on the first page of wow. search results. Now, that's kind of nuts. That's, 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 that's overdoing it. And then I, let me just point out to the listeners how profound that is because there's people who make a lot of money to try to get your page on that first 10 search engine optimization. So they're effectively doing it for free on their own behalf. Oh, this is free. This is what yeah, they, the, they're, they're doing it themselves. They're doing yeah. it themselves. See, I'm, I'm not worried about, you know, all the SEO people competing with yeah, each yeah. other and trying to, you know, that's all competitive. That's right. not a threat to anybody. That's not a threat to, to democracy or to commerce or, but when Google itself, the platform itself, when it has some sort of agenda, uh, you, number one, without a monitoring system, you would never know it. Uh, and number two, there's no way to counteract right, it. Right, right. How do you counteract that? That's... That's insane. Now, as it happens, I, I was a very strong Hillary Clinton supporter. I am not a conservative, but I was horrified when I saw a pro-Hillary Clinton bias in all 10 positions of, of search results. Uh, I was horrified by that. That's because you don't know day to day what they're going to be supporting or who they're going to be supporting. And this is invisible. It's an invisible manipulation on a massive scale. I don't want them. I don't want anyone to have that power, including our government for that matter. I don't want anyone to have that kind of power. Yeah, it's, in, it's insidious. Of course. Because, I mean, of, because of the nature of it. It's, I mean, if they were a, some kind of rare conservative search engine and they're going to have Trump, Trump all day long, that's fine. Uh, I, I, like, uh, the, you know, Fox News or MSNB. That's the thing. So I, I spent a lot of time on Twitter. The, the people have the issue with CNN, the people on the right, not with MSNBC, because MSNBC portrays itself as left, Fox is right, CNN portrays itself as objective, but they're in many ways to the left of MSNBC, and that's kind of what you're talking about, whereas they're portraying themselves as this, you know, marketplace of idea, of ideas, excuse me, but if every single search result is skewed towards Hillary Clinton, clearly this is an asymmetry in how the data is being presented. Well, for sure. And the, the, the line that bothered me most in that recently uh, leaked video from Google, uh, it wasn't the crying. Oh, crying was crazy. I mean, I, it was crazy. But the, the line that really bugged me was... I when... like how the head of psychology today is being like, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. You're not even using a euphemism. Yeah. The medical term is crazy. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's a term. Yeah, we use that term. Uh, at least when we're home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, the line that really got me was when their chief financial officer got up there and, you know, and, and, and serious as can be said, we are going to use the full power and reach of our company to promote our values. I mean, wow, that's, you know, again, it's, it's crazy to, to be, a, you basically at that point, we're, we're, a, we're a fly on the wall and we're seeing what the discussion is like inside. And that's in a big forum. Imagine the little forums. Imagine the meetings that take place uh, in Google and the kinds of discussions they have, knowing the power that they have. Wouldn't you exercise that power if, number one, you could do so invisibly? Number two, it was perfectly legal? Right. Wouldn't you do it to, to promote your business and, in this case, promote your values? Well, let, let's let's do a little bit of Catch-22, right? Because on the one hand, the EU is probably going to have values similar to our own. The Chinese government is going to have values that are very dissimilar to our own. So when they say they're going to be promoting values, can't they make the argument that, look, when we're in China, we're going to be turning China in a more democratic direction? Well, what's happening with China is, is an exception for Google because Google got thrown out of China actually a few years ago. Uh, obviously, there have been meetings at Google in which people have said, hey, you know, that's a, it's more than a billion people in a very the fastest growing economy in the world. You know, we, let's try again. Let's try again. Let's try. So what's happening there is they, uh, you know, as their own employees have pointed out, they're, they just seem to be selling out. They're saying, okay, we're going to help you, the government of China, promote your values. Right. But that seems to be an exception. So I think in the rest of the world, um, they're not making deals like this with governments, not that I know of. I think they're just doing whatever the heck they want. I mean, the, the fact is you've got this new kind of industry that just, for the most part, is completely unregulated. 
uh, where generally speaking, people don't even understand what's going on. You know, uh, you know, I you don't, don't think you... most people would be able to understand what's going on. Well, but the problem is, it's not so pe that people don't know. They don't. They don't even know what they don't right. know. Okay. They don't, you know, this is this is new territory for humanity, and I think that that one of the coolest guys in this new film, the creepy line, which um, and I'm I'm honored to sit here next to the the creator, the director here. Um, uh, but I think one of the coolest characters in there is this, uh, this computer software genius named Jaron Lanier. Is that the one with the dreadlocks? Yeah. <laughs> right. And he's basically, he basically says at some point, I, th it's a, I think it's part of a TED talk, he basically says uh, humanity can't survive unless we solve this particular problem. That's how important this problem is. And, and every single day that we wait, this problem gets larger. It's it's believe me the google doesn't just donate to democrats they donate mainly to democrats but they donate it now they're donating to republicans too oh of course they, they they're gonna like this is like what trump talked about during the campaign he's like of course i donate to hillary it's, i was a businessman it's my job to get along with everyone and this is what well, happens sure, when sure. you have corporate and, and government collusion yes but they, they but they not only donate to to kind of you know get the attention of the candidate those candidates know they're and if they don't know they they learn quickly that Google has the power to throw them out of office. Google has the power to make them disappear, like they did to, to Dr. Peterson. Google has the power to make them disappear. Uh, you know, so they generally speaking, our, our legislators are scared to death. Our elected officials are scared to death. Businesses around the world are scared to death of Google. Uh, the head of uh, uh, Europe's largest publishing conglomerate, uh, Dopfner is his name, Matthias Dopfner, actually published an open letter to Eric Schmidt, the head of Google at the time, about the fear of Google. It's about the fear that companies around the world have about whether at any moment in time, with, without any, any warning at all, a, a company will be deranked. It'll be demoted in right. search rankings or removed or completely removed. And that happens all the time. And not only are there no regulations, no advisory groups, no transparency, not only that, when, when people have sued Google who have been punished in this way, they've lost every single time. Uh, the a most recent case that is so troubling to me personally because I was following it for years and I talked to some of the people involved was uh, involved a company called eVentures. Google had suddenly just removed all of their websites from their uh, rankings, basically nearly driving them out of business. They sued. Okay, the court decision came down last year and you only have to read the first paragraph to be horrified because what the judge said was, Hey, Google is just exercising its right to free speech. So when it gives you search results, it's just exercising free speech. It, uh, you know, they can do anything they want, period. And they can act arbitrarily because they're just talking. Matt, how has your behavior changed as a consequence of making this movie vis-a-vis -vis social media? I mean, you know, it's interesting because I've, I've always been somewhat skeptical of social media anyway. So, like, you know, I post, like, architecture pictures and things. You know, I'm not a big opinion poster online. Um, I did eliminate all Google products or as many as I possibly could. I, I eliminated all Facebook products, you know. And, again, I wasn't – I am not. I was never a Google fan. I've always, you know, been part of the Apple-Google fight. I've always been more of an Apple guy. I use Apple products. I edit on Apple systems and things like that. So – Google to me was more interesting. I have an in interest in technology, um, seeing them kind of build these systems in the early days. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, as we... Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is what happens when you get off a flight and forget to turn your phone off. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I, I mean, I think, I think that this has become a very important issue. Um, you know, the... the, the what I learned in the making of the film was the election manipulation. I mean, there, it's kind of like uh, going back to the government versus Google thing. 
One thing I know about government is they're inefficient and full of idiots, mm -hmm. and Google's not. Like that's, I think that's where like I start kind of getting the heebie-jeebie. So when you think, oh, the government's watching you, know, I'm from Washington D.C. You know, I have family who worked in the Kennedy administration. There's an inefficiency to it, in that you know, you know people in the government. You're like, how do you work in the government? You know, how do you work at the State Department? These people are just not inefficient. I mean, they are completely 100% focus they know what they're doing you know they're not the career punch in punch out of five o'clock and i think that's kind of where you know m my behavior has changed in kind of how i view them as a totalitarian force i mean i knew they were bad but i never i didn't realize the scale of how bad they were yeah i wrote a piece for observer a couple of years ago when they when twitter banished milo and i i called it stalinist and i i used that word specifically because when his account was uh, was when he was kicked off Twitter, his account was deleted. So it's not like it's archived, so you can look for yourself and judge. Okay, why did this person do what he did? What rules are being enforced in order to kick somebody off that are objective? And I know, okay, I don't do this. This is inappropriate. Like like you were pointing out, and you said also, Doctor Epstein, they're arbitrary. They never explain none of these. Twitter, Facebook, Google, they never explain themselves uh, because if they explain themselves, like okay, you're not allowed to you know use this, this, and this. It'll be a lot easier for people to be like, okay, you're a private company. You know, I, I can't go in like a Chinese restaurant order order you know Indian food you know fine I'll, I'll follow these rules and, and that's perfectly appropriate it is very arbitrary and it's also after the fact the fact that Twitter recently I'm sure you find this disturbing has said well we're also going to be monitoring what people do off Twitter and it basically if they're jerks then we're going to be kicking them off a platform mm -hmm. that is really uh, kind of uh, a self abrogating a power that is is unprecedented well that's that's the problem here over and over again is the 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 kind of power that's never existed before, the scale of power that's never existed before. And, you know, the question is, can, can regulators, can legislators, can antitrust investigators, can anyone help us? Right. Is the question. Uh, I have, uh, let's put it this way. I keep getting invited more and more to meetings with lots of lawyers. Now, now some of my best friends are lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> But I, it's torture for me. It's torture for me going to these meetings. I, I, have you ever been in a room for with like room full of fifty lawyers and they're all just? I went to Yeshiva, so probably. Oh yeah, <laughs> and then you did, <laughs> and you you know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, these lawyers are all talking about you know law, regulation, antitrust, and so on. And basically, over and over and over again, what I'm realizing is I don't think the usual methods are going to help us here. And can I just jump in on that? Sure. Because I'm sure Google is going to be able to outwit the law. And you've seen it happen. All these things you're talking about. The guy didn't get fired. $25,000? Okay, who cares? I mean, this is not even a rounding error for them. Exactly. So, uh, I, I and, and what I'm seeing is these mechanisms operate very slowly. Uh, tech operates very rapidly. Yes. I, I don't think law or regulation is ever going to catch up. I don't think it has any chance at all of catching up. So in my mind, again, I, my thinking has just shifted over the years. I keep thinking, no, there is a solution here. And the solution is to set up what I call a worldwide ecology of passive monitoring systems. So it's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's, it's basically taking what I did in 2016 in monitoring uh, the search results, uh, the election-related search results that people were being shown. Oh, this is a great idea. It's like, yeah. it, this is what, when you go to Whole Foods, this is how you know the food is organic, go to the supermarket, this is how you know the food's kosher. It's an independent agency, or in right. this case, independent technology, That's right. that is going, it's, it, and it's not Google saying, trust us, saying, no, 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 we're not related to this company, and we're going to scan it as, as it goes. Oh, go ahead, this is fascinating. Right, and this is, uh, as I envision it, and I am working on this actively with some business partners and academics on three continents, uh, you know what I'm envisioning is not is non-governmental, it's international, uh, and it it quick and super quick, and it takes the kind of of a monitor system that I developed in 2016, and it scales it up so that uh, we are looking over the shoulders of probably tens of thousands of people around the world with their permission, because they're 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 doing good for humanity, you know. And so we're looking over their shoulders and we're seeing all kinds of things. And we're even listening uh, when the Google Home device or yes. Siri or uh, Amazon Echo uh, is talks. We're even listening in there, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're uh, 
we're collecting the data, we're uh, analyzing it rapidly, and we're looking for signs of bias. We're looking for signs of manipulation. Uh, anything that maybe isn't covered currently by law, but that should be brought to someone's attention. And then we bring it to someone's yeah, attention. Yeah. Federal Election Commission, the, whoever it may be. Google and all these other sites, Facebook, they claim, Facebook certainly, they claim they want to be unbiased, right? And that a lot of this is a consequence of the math, or so to speak. Do you think that that's in, uh, untrue? It's absurd. It's absolutely, it's, okay. it's, it's not only untrue, it's just, it's just ludicrous. Ludicrous. Like... Ludicrous speed as so, yes, yeah, baseballs. Yeah. You remember spaceballs? Uh, no, that's 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 absurd. They they have they have values. They have goals. They you know they have uh, they have a profit motive. Yeah. Uh, you know they they uh, so they're going to do what's best uh, for them. And a lot of what they can do is invisible. Let me give you a super quick example here of something very scary that Facebook can do probably does but without a monitoring system right we can't see it okay so here it is what if on election day in 2016 mark zuckerberg that morning had sent out go out and vote reminders to, uh, yes i know where this is going yeah yeah exclusively to supporters of hillary clinton because he knows who's, who those people are or just mainly how about mainly to supporters of hillary clinton i i so i submit that if he did either of those things no one would ever know but we do oh, or know. to the people on the audience who are on the left, let's pretend he did it for Trump, okay? If it'll make it, you know, fine. It'll, sure, sure. sure yeah. Let's say he says go out and vote, but he sends only to that only to Trump supporters. Well, whoever he did it for, that would have given that person an additional 450,000 votes. Now, how do I know that number? Because it's an extrapolation from data that Facebook itself has published. Wow. So, because they did an experiment, Facebook experiments on us. Ooh, <laughs> and they did an experiment, in, in which they published in 2012, uh, in which they uh, they wanted to see whether go out and vote reminders would get more people to vote, and they concluded based on the, on sending a reminder to 60 million people, that in fact an additional 320,000 people in 2010 actually got up off their sofas and and went and voted, and then Facebook made that happen. So if they do that selectively, so this is a uh, a, a phenomenon we call, which we're studying, and we call TME or the targeted messaging effect. Yeah. If they did that selectively, wow, no one would know uh, unless there's a monitoring system in place. Because with a monitoring system, we would detect a manipulation like that probably within a few minutes. And here's the other thing if it was regulation and they were learned about it after the fact, it's not like the election's going to get invalidated. Sure, mm -hmm. they'll pay their fine, but they got their president. Or the candidates, so th there's not even a, a way to f revert it back to what it should have should have been. Air quotes. On the other hand, if uh, in recent months uh, Facebook has been sending out targeted messages mainly to supporters of one particular party uh, to affect the primaries. Oh yeah. Or how about this? How about in recent months they've been sending out register to vote reminders mainly to supporters of one particular political party well think of think of the of the influence that that would exert over time you literally could shift millions of votes and imagine what a scandal would be if the government the trump government said voter registration forms only to republicans everyone would be in an uproar and correctly so including republicans would be in an uproar like this would be unconscionable and yet this is what they have the power to do and and the, as you're pointing out not only can they do this no one would know so if the republicans did it it would be very quickly found out and it would be everywhere let, let me let me just say something about the no one about that issue the no one would know issue uh when when someone publishes online a uh let's say a a video on youtube you know it's there we can see it. In fact, very often some of these get downloaded so that even if, uh, if they get erased on yeah. YouTube, they just get reposted. How about a fake news story? Well, again, it's there. You can see it's like a billboard, very much like a billboard. But the kinds of, of phenomena that we've been uh, discovering and studying, they're different. They're very different because the, the content is not posted anywhere for people to look right. at and examine. It's ephemeral content. It, it's, it's generated on the fly just for you and then it's gone yeah yeah and it leaves no trace it's not stored anywhere so again monitoring systems would capture ephemeral content on a massive scale and they would detect all kinds of crazy things which are probably happening 
There's a, another, I'll, I'll give you a little scoop here because this article is coming out soon, but it hasn't come out yet. There's another uh, uh, manipulation we're studying, which is called OME, the opinion matching effect. And this one's really scary because uh, what you'll find is that there are more and more services online uh, which purport to help you pick the right candidate by asking you some basic questions. Now, as it happens, uh, in 2016, Tinder, Tinder, which is for hookups, Tinder did this and they called it swipe the vote. So you, uh, you know, they, uh, they hit you with a couple of questions about immigration and the wall and that kind of thing. And then you swipe left or swipe right. And then they said, oh, the best candidate for you is, well, think about that computer programming. How would you know? Uh, if there was bias in, right. you know, in, in the oh, match, yeah. in the match, you, you, the fact is you would have absolutely no way of knowing. And there's one website out there, which I talk about in my article, I'm not going to, not going to identify yeah. it here. There's one website out there that has, that has, they claim to have helped now more than 49 million people to find the right candidate. They're up and running now. And in fact, they're advising people right this minute. Uh, regarding three elections in the, in the state of New York, and they're they're also now helping to match you to the right candidate for president in 2020. We have last question from the chat room. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the best alternative to Google? Well, Google has lots of products, so you kind of have to go product by product. But uh, for Google.com, forget that. You must never ever use that. Uh, right now, uh, I use StartPage. StartPage.com gives you access to Google's index, but without the tracking. Oh, okay. Now, Google could could cut them off at some point, but right now, in my opinion, that's that's the best option because it gives you the best search results without tracking. Uh, people sometimes talk about DuckDuckGo. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you good results because it's not even a real search engine. It's actually just an aggregator. So, um, so there's a partial answer, StartPage.com. For Gmail, Forget it. Forget it. You're crazy if you use Gmail. Uh, right now, the best alternative, uh, the only, uh, well, one of the only truly private email services is called Proton Mail. Yeah. Okay. You can get on it for free. You can, depending on how heavily you use it, you'll probably be able to use it for a year or more before you have to pay anything. And then after that, yeah, you have to pay, but uh, it's not much. It's cheap. And what's your privacy worth is, is the question. Uh, Chrome is the Google browser. You're nuts if you use Chrome. Forget Chrome. Right now, the best alternative is called Brave, brave.com. And Brave is, uh, was, is being developed by the guy who developed Firefox. So these people know what they're doing. It's open source. Hundreds of people around the world are working to make it better and better. It is faster than Chrome. It, it eliminates all ads. And by the way, it's a very different browsing experience when there are no ads. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a faster, cooler, um, I don't know. It's just that you feel better. You feel safer. No ads and no tracking. Uh, you're nuts if you use Android, which is another Google product that monitors you whether you're online or offline. You are crazy to use an Android device. So what else is there? Well, obviously, there is the world of Apple. There's the iPhone. Um, and uh, I carry a... Here it is. Here it is for the camera. I actually uh, use a BlackBerry which is uh, right now still the most uh, secure phone in the world. But whatever you use, don't use Android is, is the question. So I could go on and on. But if I, I, I think if people want to learn more about this, how they personally can protect themselves a little bit, uh, you can find my essay online, which is called Seven Simple Steps to Online Privacy. We'll add that to the show notes page. Uh, the, the the trailer's at thecreepyline.com, correct? Yep. Uh, Matt, great job with the documentary. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Epstein, thank you so much. There's, this was so thought provoking and it was just so dense, but still entertaining. So this is something are you, that- Are you calling me dense? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I usually am pretty bitchy. So I, I, <laughs> the fact that I, I didn't have anything to say. No, but it was just, it was just, you're sitting there because this, it was so thought provoking because this is something that has impacted all of our lives in, as a cliche though, but it's true in so many different ways that when you sit there and you're t dissecting. You're like, do you realize this is happening? Do you realize this is happening? We don't. And it's the the invisible aspect of it, which you have identified, which I agree is both the most interesting and by definition, you know, the most pernicious. So thank you both so much, very much. Uh, 
to be redundant, but I'm a little jet lagged. I will see you all next week. You are welcome. Oh,